businesses post pandemic. What does the culture shift um, for recruiting new talent and retaining existing staff look like? So, Joe, I'll come to you if I may, first of all, please. Um, I know that you work with SMEs and corporates um, to support them with their recruitment. Um, how have they adapted um, their recruitment practices over the past 17 months? Okay, thank you, Lee. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I'll say firstly that at the start of the pandemic, a lot of companies went into complete panic. Um, and I think HR departments were key to ensuring that culture was, um, was at the top of the agenda for organisations. Um, and I think as the, the pandemic went on, I think companies realised that they had to actually do an awful lot more workforce. And in terms of um, how they went about that, it, it, it was a complete mix of things. But those companies that got it right were the ones that regularly kept in contact with their workforce, engaged them, organised team events, um, really looked after their staff, looked after their mental health, really just made sure that their employees, they were talking to them and engaging with them the whole of the way through. I think as we got closer to the end of last year, things changed quite considerably and there was a, a shift. Um, and those companies that didn't maintain that working on the culture, actually started to lose some of their staff and the staff have started to go to other organizations where they can see that the culture has been maintained throughout um, i think i think it's it has been very difficult for companies to keep that that, that feeling i know myself from my company you know we, we had a great culture we still have a great culture but actually maintaining it when you're not seeing your in your, your employees is actually quite hard so i think as the as companies start to open up um however i am seeing at the moment that companies are pushing that back even further so i think we all thought we would start opening up offices now. Um, I've noticed that that's actually been pushed back further. So I think individuals within organisations just need to feel valued. They need to feel that their companies are looking after them and that they've got they've got the support of their their employers. Thank you very much. And next, I'm going to go to uh, Louise and Jessica because, of course, you guys are running businesses and and have. You started businesses during the pandemic. So um, have you recruited during the pandemic? Um, and if so, what did you do differently um, to what you would perhaps usually have done? Shall I jump in there, Lee? Great, Louise, thank you. No worries. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear Joe describe um, how things have even changed within the pandemic. It's such a moving feast really and um, I think for technology companies companies you know like Jessica's like mine where we're used to working in agile ways um, that changes our currency anyway so you know kind of getting used to things changing but right at the beginning of the um, pandemic we actually recruited not obviously knowing it was going to happen uh, we recruited four new members of our tech team um, who I still am yet to meet face to face. So I've had obviously a lot of communication with them. And, you know, as, as Joe said, communication has been key through throughout all of this. Um, but it's, it's just so strange to have a team that you're relying on and they're so, so much a part of your culture and a part of your business, but you've never actually been in a room with them um, is, is, quite, is quite a difficult and challenging thing. However, to say that, it opens lots of opportunities. Um, so instead of thinking about re just recruiting in our very you know, close facility and, and, and looking at people that are really close to us, we can now look at our network of spaces across the UK. We've got 27 spaces. Uh, we've just opened our latest hub in Paris. 
So now we can start thinking about, well, how do we recruit people from those hubs and those spaces? Because actually this is working, this is working really well. So yes, we've recruited and it's been challenging, but I think it's also opened up a whole host of opportunities to us as a business. Jess, I don't know if you felt, Jessica, the same about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, a lot of similarities, particularly actually when you mentioned agile working. I'll just pre-qualify what I'm about to say with I used to work in a factory before I worked at, at before I set up younger. And, you know, as you can imagine, in a factory, you have to be on site. You can't produce things if you're not there. Um, and so going from that culture, we actually set up the business whilst we were still working um, for other companies. But there was never any intention, I suppose, to recruit at that point in time. We were doing mainly sort of policy work around skills and around apprenticeships. And it was, you know, it was, it was very much around sort of challenging perceptions and, and challenging governments a little bit. And when the pandemic happened, just a few months after we'd set up again, we didn't know it was coming. We spotted an opportunity. So I suppose we went on a really, really strong recruitment drive and we've recruited 12 people now and we've still got sort of three open positions. So we went on a really, really strong recruitment drive. We've got, you know, maybe 50% of the workforce living somewhere around Wales, um, others in sort of North London, Maidstone, one's about to move to Taiwan. Um, so we've got people all over the place. And, you know, it's interesting when you talk about culture, because that is our culture. I mean, we, we were born out of the pandemic and, and we, I suppose, we didn't see the, the, the negative aspects in remote working. We just seized that opportunity to do things a little bit differently and actually Agile working practices, very different, as I say, to, to manufacturing, those agile working practices have been absolutely critical to being able to create a, a culture where, you know, same as Louise, I've not met 60, 70 percent of my staff, um, yet we've got this really, really close collaborative culture that we've created through those agile ways of working. In terms of how we did the recruitment process, because I know that was the sort of original question, what did we do differently? Not a huge amount. Um, what I would say is we really focused our efforts on, firstly, the selection criteria that we were using. So obviously we could, we could look wider, we could recruit from a, a much wider pool, and, and we certainly took advantage of that to get the best talent that we could. But instead of recruiting for experience or qualifications, as we did when we were in manufacturing, we recruited for potential. We just looked for people who had the right attitude and the right ingredients to work in the kind of culture that we were creating. She's very collaborative, you know, very sort of um, agile, as we say, very creative. And so we, we set our stall up on what we called AAA criteria, attitude, aptitude and ambition. And we recruited purely on that criteria. And we still measure people today when we do the performance management on those three criteria and how much they've grown and how far they've come since they've joined us. So I think that was really critical to taking advantage of this, you know, big new world uh, that had been created from remote working. And then in terms of actually bringing them into the company, I think onboarding becomes so much more important, right? Because those little things that you take for granted when you work in a physical environment, like meeting people in the office, you don't have that. So you have to make a real effort to onboard people, giving them tasks, you know, before they even start to get familiar with the brand and the way the company works and, you know, feeling like they're hitting the ground running on, on day one. That's really important. We set up Speed Connects, you know, we, we set up over 40 meetings in a space of three weeks just for people to build for no reason other than to just build those personal relationships. So, yeah, I, I think when you're building that culture, the onboarding becomes really, really important. Otherwise, you lose them before they even begin. Thank you so much. And, and actually, you've sort of started to touch on my next question, because that is, um, what would you guys um, regard as the pros and cons of virtual recruitment? And I think we have started to touch on there in terms of some opportunities and challenges and some of the positives you've seen. But do you have maybe two or three particular pros or cons that you feel you've you've seen um during virtual recruitment shall i go first oh, thank you thank you yeah i mean i think the, the the pros outweigh the cons um it gives an organization a much wider field to recruit from um i think 
there's a few challenges that come with that. Um, there are regional salary differences, um, unless a, a company is willing to pay the going rate nationally to, to hire an employee, um, they run the risk of, of losing somebody. Um, agile working, remote working is not for everybody. So there are certain, um, certain groups of people with skills that do not want to do that and want to have physically go into an office. But I think for an employer, just the scope of candidates and skills that they have access to is much greater. Fantastic. Thank yeah, you, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure both Louise and Jessica have found that as well. Anything that you would perhaps say is, is, is more of a, a con or perhaps a negative that you've seen come out of the last sort of 17 months in terms of recruitment? In, in terms of virtual recruitment, I think one of the, you know, one of the, the challenges that, that you, you have is, you know, when you bring someone into an organization and it's those, those early days where you're deciding, is this person right for us? And they're deciding, am I right for this organization? Um, you know, you might have, especially if it's a senior role, um, it might be part of your SLT, you might be looking to bring someone in who's, going to fulfill you know a certain function that your business needs to grow and to scale um, and in order to do that you want to get to know that person and you know over the, the years and I'm sure Joe will have lots of you know ways of different ways that organizations do this but you find ways for your business to you know find out what you think about that person and that might be lots of face-to-face -face meetings it might be that you set, as, as Jessica mentioned earlier, there might be tasks that you set, um, which are really focused on think outcomes that you want for your particular business. Um, and you do that as part of a process, which I think we've all missed a bit of over the last year, which is that kind of people describe it as the photocopier moment or the, the water cooler moment where that person might just be coming in for the day coming into the your environment, whether that's a, you know, a factory an office wherever you're based. And, you know, you're kind of, it's that horrible phrase, but you're eyeballing that person. Um, now, when you do that virtually, it becomes almost more like a one-to-one -one interview would be. And we all know, we've all probably been there ourselves as an interview E and as an interviewer, you know, that is quite a contrived situation. Um, and I think it's a little bit like that as well, virtually people can, you know, create an amazing backdrop and almost script something that they're going to say. And so one of the things I would say is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a negative is that you don't get those spontaneous moments where you think this person is so right for our organization or do you know what they might not be quite right for for what we're looking for so um yeah that's a challenge but i think there are some things that you can do to mitigate that um and one of the things that jessica just gave you know an excellent example of that in terms of speed connecting you don't need to just do a virtual interview with hr or with the ceo or with the slt you know you can you can create all sorts of virtual relationships and and, and opportunities to discuss with the wider team um, and I thought the Speed Connect idea was a really great one. So there are some negatives, but I think you can mitigate them by some, you know, being a bit creative with how you get that person interviewed. Thanks, Louise. Jessica, anything to add on that from, from your experiences? Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for the most part, very, very similar. I would say one of the, the difficulties with a remote culture is sustaining engagement um, because people do have more freedom. They have more flexibility. I mean, I've got some guys that work at two in the morning, right? And it, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. We have core working hours. So we expect people to sort of be available for three hours a day just to meet and interact with other people um, because it's really important. Otherwise, those, those people would just never, ever see anybody. And, and you do run the risk of people becoming slightly disengaged. There are always ways to manage that. But I think what it requires is a really, really strong sort of HR I don't want to say department because we haven't got an HR department, right? We devolve HR to line management, but you know, even, even that in itself, it requires a strong focus on HR and on people and on well-being and keeping them 
you know, motivated and engaged and feeling empowered, you know, it goes back to Maslow's hierarchy and, and we do engagement quizzes all the time, right? So we send out three times a week questions. How happy are you today? Simple things like that. Have you got the tools you need to do your job? Um, you know, does your manager give you timely feedback? We send out those kinds of questions all the time and we are constantly monitoring, you know, the response rates and obviously the scores that they're giving us and looking for areas where we can improve and, and re-engage. And I think that is, a challenge in any organization, but a particular challenge where you don't meet people. Um, if I can just pick up on a point in the chat, because I think that's really interesting. So it says, if you're recruiting nationally and not just locally, how do you plan to transition back into the office coming out of the pandemic? So I suppose this is, this is a startup's perspective, right? And I'm not saying that all companies can do this, but we describe ourselves as a digitally native company. So we have no plans to ever have business premise. Um, we may do hot desking, we may have hubs in certain areas, we may use some of Louise's hubs uh, in the future. I think that would be the ideal sort of uh, compromise, the, the right kind of structure for us. But we have absolutely no intention of having business premise. And there's a few reasons for that. I mean, one is obviously cost. We would not have been able to scale at the rate that we have and develop the products that we have and, and help the, you know, the, the customers that we have if we'd had the cost of you know, physical infrastructure, because believe you me, digital infrastructure costs as well, right? And I'm sure Joe and Louise have got experience of this, but it's not cheap when you set up a proper um, digital infrastructure for remote working. So we wouldn't have been able to scale if we'd had that physical premise. And actually what we really, really like is giving people that flexibility to work when they want, you know, and, and to measure them based on their value creation and their contribution and their creativity and their learning rather than measuring them based on how long they've spent with their bum at a desk in an office somewhere. So that's a startup's view. I know, I know it's very different for other organisations, but I thought it was worth picking up on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jess. Thank you very much. Okay, okay just, well, oh, sorry, can I just on, add something in there as, as well? Um, I think organisations have had to learn to trust very, very significantly um, Micromanagement needs to go out of the window with agile working, with remote working. You, you really need to have faith in your employees. If the productivity is there, you know, if they've got the right values, if they're doing the right thing, you need to trust them. You, you need to let them get on and do the job. If they're not doing the job, that's a different matter. But yeah, just trust is absolutely key. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you. So, so moving on then, I'm thinking about um, onboarding new team members in a virtual world. What would you describe as some best practices? Jess, can I come to you first on this one, please? Yeah, of course. Um, I suppose much of what I've said, really, uh, certainly setting some tasks up front. So we've got, you know, a, a creative person who joined us recently and we sort of gave her the brand guidelines and we gave her access to one of the new products we're developing. And we said, you know, just get a feel for the brand, you know, speak to some of these people, get to talk into some new team members, you know, interview them, see what they think, and then try and create basically graphics representing different sectors. Try and create one of these graphics that kind of fits that, you know, that brand, but put your own spin on it. So we tried to engage her in that way and that worked really well. And it also gave us confidence that we'd, you know, made the right decision because the work she produced was, was really, really good and, you know, quite different to, to what we would have done, but, but still in keeping with the brand. So that definitely works, you know, and we've done that with technical hires, we've done it with creative hires, we've done it with more sort of business, you know, senior hires, and, and that definitely works. You know, other things, induction. Right. So typically, as you might expect, there is a huge pool of graduates out there at the moment, not able to find employment, good quality graduates. So we've ended up picking up, you know, a number of graduates and they've never worked before. Right. So when you do induction, it's not just about talking about your company. I mean, you do do that. You talk about who you are and where you're going and why you set up and what problems you're trying to solve. And you talk about the culture, but also talking about employment rights. Right. Doing that up front, being transparent. And, and again, going back to Joe's point about trust, trust works both ways. They have to trust you. And I think that's particularly difficult when you've never met anybody. So in that remote working environment, they have to learn to trust you and they have to trust that you're going to pay them on time. You're not going to you know, 
pay them less than what they're worth. You're going to look after them. You're going to make sure that they get their breaks and their holidays and all those things that are difficult to do when you're not actually supervising someone. So I, I really, really think that, you know, spending some time, it's amazing how many people don't know their employment rights. And that's something I learned in a factory, right? So many people go through their career without understanding, you know, what they are and aren't entitled to and what the expectations are. And that's the third point, really, is setting expectations and then continually reinforcing those expectations. Because one of the cons of remote working is that sometimes when you give people that flexibility, productivity can suffer right people can get into a rut of doing something they're comfortable in and not necessarily pushing themselves so it's a case of saying look we're giving you all this flexibility but the expectations are exactly the same as if you're in the workplace if there's a meeting we expect you to turn up <laughs> we had an issue with people not turning up because it's like oh well I'll, I'll come to another one you know if the meetings are in core hours and you've been given an invite you are expected to turn up or have a bloody good reason if you're not going <laughs> right and tell us that up front so it's setting some of those you know not not to be strict but to make sure people know where they stand because sometimes yeah. that's difficult so yeah that that's what's worked for us okay thank you very much and, and louise joe I, I think it on the same point but also thinking about how you introduce your company culture to new employees when you're when you're working remotely can you add to what jess has already talked about Please. Yeah, perhaps I'll go because we've actually had um, two new starts this week and two very different starts. So um, I know we're only at the middle of the point of the week, um, but it's been an interesting couple of days. So we've had a senior hire, um, a head of communications role, um, and that's taken us a while to really get that person embedded as, as Jessica described, you know, that's been a long process bringing that person into the business, but we're, um, we're an app apprenticeship provider. Um, and we also are a gateway for the kickstart scheme in Wales. Uh, so we work with Codec um, in London to be a, a kickstart gateway. So we've really focused a lot of our energies since the beginning of the year at recruiting under 25s. Um, and that's not just been into our own businesses. Uh, so I've got two tech companies. So it's not just those companies that I've been looking to recruit young people into. It's also all of the businesses that are within our hub network um, and are looking for under 25s. Now, this is a great scheme kickstart. start. And if no one's come across it, it's well worth looking it up because what it does, it, it will pay the salary of someone aged under 25 for six months. So um, you're taking that person on with some support, some government funded support for their salaries. Um, and it also gives you a small budget, 1500 pounds upfront um, in order to give that, that young person some training, which as Justice mentioned, really, really important to, to make sure they understand, you know, how business works and what their rights are and how HR works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that has brought a number of challenges because when you bring in, a senior person into the organization it's more than likely that person has worked in other environments either similar to your own or into other corporate environments where if they are remote and you're not with them all of the time holding their hands and helping them get embedded and um, that's okay because they can fill in some of the gaps themselves for the young people especially a start we had uh, this week 18 um only experience has been school um, very, very talented, exceptionally talented, exceptionally enthusiastic, but has a lot more gaps than someone who is experienced. And so that person needs much more of an intensive support network within the organization, especially while we're in this kind of virtual culture, hybrid working as we are at the moment. So we've, we've put a scheme in place where um, for especially for the younger people coming into the organization and not just learning about our business but learning about business in general um, and how it is different from school jessica's right you do have to turn up for meetings and that is something we've also <laughs> encountered as well because they think oh we'll perhaps skip it for today we'll just go and have an early lunch um but those young people do need that extra support so we've embedded a 
it sounds a, a little immature, but it's not. We've embedded a buddy scheme where those young people have someone more senior in the organisation who is basically on hand via Slack, um, via all the other channels that that young person will find most useful to them and can be constantly um, encouraged to ask questions and get support where they need to. So I think it's different challenges. Um, for you know different people that you're bringing into the organization but such an opportunity at the moment to bring under 25s into business um, and that funding is there so it, you know it just needs a little bit of extra thinking i think before you you plunge into it thanks louise and, and joe sort of coming on to a, another point but related to what louise and jessica have just said um, do you think and, and have you seen maybe that, that the current situation um, now means that diversity, inclusion and equality um, is sort of improved and, and it's an opportunity for employers to recruit outside of their usual pool? I don't know how to answer that other than yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, so uh, okay, I will... I'll talk about um, diversity in the, the Southwest and a particular diversity, eth I can never say that word, eth eth ethnicity. Ready? Ethnicity. Thank you so much. It <laughs> just can't come out of my mouth. Um, a lot of employees are trying really hard to improve the diversity, but because of the makeup of workforce locally, that's not able to happen. But because they're able to recruit nationally, that's that's definitely helped. So yes. Go, go ahead, Jess. I just want to add to that because I think it's a really, really important point. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just looking. I've got a wasp up there. If I just start <laughs> off camera, it's because I'm not very good with wasps, right? It's going out. It's fine. Um, no, just to add add to that because it is a really, really important point. What you can achieve if you deliberately set out to do so when you create your remote working environment is a very, very inclusive workplace. So, you know, if there are physical barriers that, that you may get from a disability, if there are, you know, mental health barriers, you know, of which we've experienced almost every type of diversity you can imagine, you can almost always accommodate for that. And it does require um, some input and it does require really good one-to-one -one communication with that employee but you can create an environment that works for that person that engages them in a way that is very, very difficult in a, in a physical working environment. So, yeah, I mean, for me, if you create that inclusive environment and if you create an inclusive employer brand and your advertising and your recruitment is inclusive, you naturally uh, recruit a much, much more diverse workforce. And that's certainly what, what we've experienced. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to add to that, Lee, because I think that um, one of the th you don't have to have any great schemes to start with. I think it's about starting the conversation. And um, I've just noticed actually on the call that one of my team has joined, Jess Phillips, yeah. I can see, is on the call. Um, and right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, Jess came to me and we, we were running lots of different online training support for businesses to. Um, not just survive the pandemic, but find ways to thrive. Um, and Jess came to me and she said, look, I've got this idea around, you know, the key pillars of um, inclusion and diversity in the workplace. And I'd like to start running um, a, a program of events around those key pillars. So each month we'll explore um, through a brand that Jess came up with, Be The Change. Um, and we'll have some key speakers around those core pillars and we'll just throw that conversation out there to our community and let's, let's start to highlight some of the best practice that's out there. And I thought this was a fantastic idea because often when we talk about diversity, we focus a lot on the negative things that are happening in that, in that area rather than really highlighting the amazing work that some businesses and some, some of these businesses are really small and might be startups themselves but they're really thinking about how they you know address those those core pillars um and what was really interesting is it definitely got the community talking about it and it brought some brilliant speakers um and i'm not just saying it because jess is on the call i'd say it anyway jess did a 
fantastic job of chairing those those events and, and, and really opening up the conversation. But what I feel it's done for our business is it started our teams talking about those key areas. So we don't have all the answers. We don't know, you know, all of the, for example, um, you know, in Pride Month, the key pillar we looked at was LGBTQ+. Um, and we don't have all of the answers around how we make an inclusive workforce and um, how we build a, an environment that works for, for people to feel comfortable. And the word that Jessica used yesterday, uh, earlier on, which I think is so important, empower those, those, um, those key players within your team as well but what it did is it really opened up the conversation so I would say don't be afraid of talking about diversity inclusion start the conversation and you know your teams will come up with their own ideas you you know and that's what we found with be the change so it's great that Jess is on because she might talk about it a bit later in one of the breakout rooms perhaps great thank you Louise um Okay, I'd like to sort of move the, the conversation now towards um, retention of key talent. So, uh, Louise, maybe if I, I come back to you on this one then, because you have just talked about one of your members of staff. Um, so, have you needed to make any changes to keep your staff performers engaged and to keep them happy in the virtual hybrid workforce? Perhaps we should do a bit of uh, Jessica's, you know, uh, question, weekly questionnaire things. Perhaps I could do it live now and we'll ask Jess instead. But um, no, I, I think it's about communication. You know, we, we always, we, we have regular conversations with our, you know, our senior leadership team. Um, they're talking to their teams. We're talking to our new starts. And, you know, things have changed it's a bit more difficult to say where, you know, someone's done something amazing and they come into the office in the next day and you might have put something nice on their desk or you might have, you know, got everyone around their desk and said, can we just say, well done, you know, a bit of a stand up this morning just to say, well done to this person. And that takes a little bit more planning now because, you know, you've got to think about ways of, of organizing those conversations, but that's completely doable. So I wouldn't say that we've, massively changed um the way that we're approaching looking after our i think you call them key players lee um or star players in our team but i think as we go forward the more we can communicate with our teams the better in asking them what they need to feel valued and empowered and um, you know, give them the, the tools they need to be resilient in what is such a difficult time right now. Thank you. Jess, yeah, what, what, what have you might got in place to keep the talent um, in, in your workforce? In a single statement, everyone at Youngo is an apprentice. Okay. That's quite difficult to do in practice um, because Wales doesn't necessarily have the full plethora of apprenticeship programmes currently that we would like. And there are a few gaps which we're we're working on we're actually working on a new apprenticeship at the moment it's an apprenticeship in um, a degree apprenticeship in engineering entrepreneurship if anyone's interested in finding out more about that but essentially what we offer and, and this is part of our value proposition this is part of our employer brand and we make it really really clear uh, when we advertise and we look for people who are interested in in this in particular but we commit to developing everybody who comes in so if there is a formal apprenticeship program we will use that as a vehicle but sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative than that so we design our own training we use udemy we use udacity you know we use all of these sort of um you know sort of mooc type platforms um, and we also look at professional recognition which is an area that i think a lot of people a lot of companies are, are yet to explore so we look at if we've got you know, somebody in marketing, then can we help them become, you know, chartered in marketing? Can we put them on a, a CIM diploma or, or something like that? So I suppose that is the core premise of, of how we retain people. And there's no sort of nasty clauses in the contract that they have to pay anything back because I know, you know, a lot of companies sort of do that. We're very, very transparent. As far as, you know, it goes for us, the more they can develop, the more they can increase their skills and their capability the better it is for us and the less likely they are to want to leave. Um, so we so we do it in that way. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing which we're introducing now, and this is more 
sort of reactive in a way, we recognize that a lot of the individuals that work with us are professionals in their own right. They've got, you know, interests that go beyond what they do with us. So we've got one um, lady who makes music and she's phenomenal. And she's, you know, she's made tracks for our podcast and, and things like that, but she's got such a talent um, and she can sing and she can produce music. And so what we're starting to roll out now is a portfolio career support program, which again is quite unusual for traditional businesses. Most traditional businesses will try and restrict you from doing anything else and they'll put conflict of interest clauses in and you know the, the confidentiality clauses and, and those sorts of things. But we actually promote it, we encourage it. We want people to develop their passion because again, if we can support them to build a portfolio career, then they are more likely to, I suppose, build a loyalty with us and, and want to stay with us. So they're the approaches that we use. Fantastic, thank you very much. So Joe, um, can you share with us what your employers are telling you about retention? And also really interestingly, what are clients telling you that they want in the new role? Okay, I'll, I'll talk about first what clients are trying to do to retain um, and yes, what candidates are, are looking for. Um, okay. Companies that are managing to retain their, their, their talent are doing exactly what Jessica said. They're giving them additional um, additional skills, the ability to do other things outside of work, maybe looking at volunteering. It's not just about the, the money aspect. Um, so companies that are really keeping their staff are doing so much more than just paying them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not articulating that very well. Um, but they are giving them the ability to do things outside of work. Um, so that could be working for, you know, not working, volunteering for a charity. Um, they could be given the ability to go and learn guitar lessons, that, that sort of thing. They retain the people in the organisation. Individuals that are coming to us looking for work are really interested, interested in you know, can, can they work remote? Um, what, what, what flexibility is there? What, what do I get outside of just my salary? Um, you know, it could be a cycled work scheme is important. Um, it could be that, you know, a company that's really into sustainability that matches what um, an individual's looking for. So you, you have, and one size doesn't fit all. So quite often an organization will need to have a range of flexible um, benefits that an individual can pick from. Um, have I answered that question properly? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really quite interesting that, you know, sort of suddenly employees are almost making demands and, and actually sharing their expectations around what they want from their job and what they want from a role. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, <laughs> do, do you have, Louise, Jess, do you have any examples of perhaps where you've been approached by your employees asking for specifics? Sorry, Louise, go ahead. I, I was just going to pick up on yeah. the point Jessica started and then Joe reinforced there around the kind of skills and training piece. Mm. Post pandemic, there is a lot of support, um, particularly from Welsh government. Um, but if you're not based in Wales, then, you know, UK government does have similar schemes um, to help not just those kind of under 25s but also people that have been with you longer who are looking to um it might be that they're trying to get chartered or they're trying to get best at class in their particular profession or it might be that they're looking to move um into a new area so you know what we're finding in a lot of the big organizations um that we work with is that you might have someone who's never worked in it before but is really now interested in ethical hacking and they want to become an ethical hacker but they've never really had much of an it background so there are quite a lot of programs available at the moment to businesses of all sizes um, and in wales we have something called the personal learner accounts um, and these are well worth checking out if, if you haven't done so already, um, because what they do is they will allow your employees and, and, and um, you know, business owners as well to choose any area in which um, will help that 
person up skill um, and there are nine colleges I think across Wales It'd definitely be one in, in your local area that will be able to deliver that and that can be everything from you know we talked about agile at the top you might want to learn how to to be a scrum master and um, you might want to un learn more about social media it could be something you've never done before but that is a hundred percent fully funded so an individual can apply for that and so can a business apply for that. So that's called the personal learner accounts. And then Jessica mentioned apprenticeships. It's something that as a business, we have really um, supported and supported our um, teams to interact with as well, because we see it as such an important um, way of not just funding the, the development of our teams, but also giving them the opportunity to do that um, continued professional development. Welsh Government have currently extended um, an incentive for companies to put people on apprenticeships. So if you go to the um, Business Wales apprenticeship page on their website, you'll find that if you bring on um, someone under the age of 25, and this can be an existing employee or someone new to your business, um, they can get an incentive of four thousand pounds to go on to an apprenticeship and then the apprenticeship is fully funded and someone over the age of 25 gets two thousand pounds um incentive to go on to an apprenticeship and that comes into the business to help you free up their time in order to start that qualification so there are so many um opportunities at the moment where because you might be thinking to yourself i'd love to do that i'd love to say to my staff have one day off a week and do an apprenticeship and go and study but actually we can't afford it right now we're in a pandemic you know we've we're trying to training is often the thing that companies tend to put to one side when they're trying to, to cut costs so um don't discount it get out there and have a look and if anyone's got any questions feel free i'll drop my email address in the chat um, because I've got quite a lot of detail on each of those ones that I've just spoken about and I think the most of the incentives are running now until the end of September so it's well worth getting in and having a look at those. Great thank you Louise um, so so last question from me now before we um, sort of open up the Q&A to our audience and I can see that people are starting to to share some of their questions in the chat box but before we come on to that, um, as we now look to the future, do you think these changes that we've just talked about will last in the medium and long term? Or do you think things will revert to how they were before? Joe, can I come to you first of all on that one, yeah. please? I don't, I don't believe we will ever go back to how we were before. Um, I, I think a lot of what's happening out there is actually for the best. Um, and I think employees in the main or job seekers in the main, you know, want, want to continue that flexibility. Um, as long as a company has got their culture right, I, it, it will continue. I cannot see the majority of companies going back Monday to Friday, nine to five, insisting everybody goes into the office. I just, I can't see it. No. Okay, thank you, Joe. Jessica, Louise, anything to add to that? Have you got any sort of, you know, thoughts and ideas about what, what you think might happen in the future and what you might implement or continue with? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, similar to what Joe is saying, really, I think it, it honestly depends on the business and what's right for the business you know what what is the core business what is the demographic of people that you're employing what do they want um you know it comes back to trust again for me and for for younger as a startup organization i think this one word that's going to determine how sort of you know how far we go with the the remote working and that's tax <laughs> And what I mean by that is, you know, at, at the moment, we're very, very open to employing people from all around the world. You know, we see no issue with that at all. But there have been, I suppose, you know, suggestions from big accountancy firms that the U UK should tax remote workers. Um, an additional 5%, I think the proposal was, because they're not contributing to the economy, which is bonkers, because, 
you know, sort of remote workers have a higher risk of mental health issues, but they're also contributing positively to the environment. And there's all these really, really good things. And yet, you know, th there are concerns that they're not spending enough money in coffee shops. Um, so I think it really depends on the UK's position around taxing remote workers, but also its position on employing individuals from other countries. If I look at Greece as the other end of the scale, and we know, you know, Greece's economy is, is maybe not in a fantastic state at the moment, but what they've done is really, really clever because they've used tax relief to incentivize remote workers to base themselves in Greece and to actually work for organizations in other countries. I mean, what a smart thing to do if you've got beaches like they do in Greece. So certainly something I'd be, I'd be up for. So yeah, for us, we want to be a you know digitally native global remote workforce and, and we really think that that's going to work for us and the more cultures more cultural perspectives the more diversity we can bring into the organization as we grow the better but it's really going to come down to the uk's position on tax thank you jess anything else to add on that one louise I just think going back to the diversity point, um, I, I think Jessica's right, you know, from a from a management perspective, there's going to be, you know, lots of things to think about as we as we move forward out, out of hopefully out of the pandemic um, in terms of how the government will approach um, all things to do with, you know, tax, but also health and safety, working at home and all of the other, you know, things that have been left to one side for now but are going to start to slowly creep back in but for me one of the biggest things one of the the biggest problems that businesses are coming to us with in terms of the spaces that we provide the flexible spaces that we provide and you you know you've got to bear in mind we were creating um hybrid working spaces pre the pandemic so our experience has, was in this area and we've only really accelerated but a lot of businesses, and these are startups, scaling companies, prime organizations, for them, one of the big issues is um, around equality. And if you say, we're not gonna have a base, um, and that, that doesn't need to be your own office, but it can be a base, it can be a base in a, in a you know, a shared office, a flexible working space, a hub like the NatWest hub, which is, you know, fantastic for, for companies starting out. Um, if you say we're not going to do that and we're going to work remotely, then all of a sudden it opens up lots of issues for teams across your organisations around, and, and I'm just going to name a few, but there's such a long list. Connectivity. Um, you know, you might have some team members who have fantastic connectivity where they live, others might not have um you know jessica mentioned having to all the investment that needs to go into the equipment to enable people to work at home some organizations might be asking employees to use some of their own equipment again it can create uh, you know um for those people that might not have access to that it can be really difficult and then one thing that i think i'm hearing a lot of at the moment is um for graduate employees they might be in a shared house um, they might not have a living area, they might only have their bedroom, um, compared to someone more senior in organisation who might have a three bedroom house, um, a garden. Um, so we really do need to think about in terms of hybrid working, not just, you know, productivity, and is it great for my business? Am I getting out of it what I need? But also for our people, is this a fair um, way of enabling and giving the right tools to people within our organization and i think that conversation hasn't even really begun yet but as it does heat up i think we're going to start to see you know some people that have had a very tough pandemic and are really quite keen to get back into an office environment so the question you ask will it stay like this um no because everything is always changing but i i really see a future where we'll have much more of a, a crossover between coming into spaces and then people still being able to have that flexibility to to work at home fantastic thank you ever so much so as i said um i'd like to open up now uh, into the audience q a and i can see that there's a, a couple of questions coming in uh, Dale, are you able, have you been able to capture some of these? 
What's the conversation? Absolutely, yeah. So um, we had a question earlier, mostly directed towards Louise, I think, about the, the kickstart scheme that you were talking about earlier. Is that mostly Wales based and could you just give us a bit more information on that? Yeah, no, the kickstart scheme is all, all across the UK. Um, so it's a central government funded scheme. Um, it does have some restrictions and um, it was something that was rolled out incredibly quickly uh, during the pandemic with a huge amount of funding put behind it. But as always, um, not not necessarily the framework in which to, to, to kind of deliver that funding. So the way that we've approached it as an organization and we've supported other businesses to do the same um, is to find a gateway, a kickstart gateway. You can go onto the government website. I'll put the details in the chat in a moment um, and find a gateway, someone that you might already be working with. As I said, we're a gateway here in, in Wales. You can contact us and we can perhaps put you in touch with someone that might be more closer to you if, if that works um, better. But you you basically create the job applications that you're looking to, um, the job specs that you're looking to fill. So you might say that you're looking for uh, a social media um, assistant, let's say. Uh, so you create that job specification and that has to be shared through a Kickstart coach um, as part of the job center um, plus scheme. Um, and then under 25s can apply for that role. Um, they actually have to be on universal credit or join universal credit in order to then draw down the funding. Um, but that sounds, it's, it's a bit clunky, but it, you actually can work through it quite quickly. Um, and then they start with you in the six months of their salary funded. And it's, I think you get 30 hours a week funded and then you can choose to top up if you want them to work more hours than that. that. We've chosen to top up all of ours, but you might choose to, you might not have enough work for that person to do and that 30 hours might be absolutely fine. Um, but then they come off of universal credit and they come on to your payroll. Does that answer the question, Dale? Yeah, I think that's a good amount of information there for, for that scheme. So thank you for that. Um, to you. pick up pick up on your point about um the amount of work that you can assign to people actually uh we did have another question about how you identify and plan for resource um especially with roles that founders might not have much experience with uh, i think that's hr resource so how would you work out how much work is going to be there yeah I'll, I'll just say a quick thing on this and i'll let the other panelists come in but um i'm a mentor for innovate uk for women in tech um mm -hmm. And I mentor, there's 40 winners this year. I mentor seven of them at the moment. And um, when I spoke to, did kind of like a speed uh, networking event with all of those winners, um, this was the question that came up, I would have said in 90% of the conversations. And Jessica, I'm sure will be able to speak um, about her experience in this as well. But in terms of when you're scaling a business, there, it's not like there's a book that you can open up and it says, on day 27, you need to import an FD. <laughs> and on day 32, you need to get yourself a bookkeeper. Um, so in my experience, and I've not always got it right, um, I've always let the business dictate what roles we need to fill next. And I've made sure that we've had the, the um, resource to be able to commit to that. So for a long time, when we were a tiny startup, we desperately needed um, a financial controller, but we, we didn't have the funds to get that person in. Um, but I knew, I still knew we needed it. So th there isn't a book, but I would, my advice, and Jessica, I'm sure will have some experience as well, is, is to let the business dictate when you need those roles to be filled. But there are key ones that you can't really do without. And I, I think they are, you know, a good leader at the helm and someone who can look after the money. Those two things you can't really do without. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just get over to you to, to add a bit more to that question, please. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and I think all businesses will do it slightly differently. I mean, having a bit of an HR background, we did some quite rigorous workforce planning uh, when we sort of, not when we set up the business, actually, because it was just myself and my co-founder, Tom. But when we went into that pandemic and we had this idea to kind of create this, this careers platform, 
then we knew we were going to need developers and we knew we were going to need creative um, individuals to actually bring that to life. And I don't know much about marketing and creative. I know more now um, off the back of it. But we sort of we tried to foresee as much as you can. Right. And we created a, a three year work, workforce plan um, targeting sort of 500 percent growth in, in three years. We've hit 350 percent already. Um, so we're, we're broadly on track um, for doing that. But really, as Louise says, even if you do create a plan and a structure, the point at which you enact those different roles is really dependent on how the business is developing and, and where your skills gaps are. One of the things that we do is keep um, some really good sort of up to date skills matrices, quite a traditional tool, but it just helps you to see where the gaps are in the organization. You get a feel for it day to day anyway, but it but it really does help to sort of focus your mind and say, right, we really need a back end developer because we're weak on AWS, um, for example. So, yeah, that's sort of the approach we've taken is to really link your workforce requirements to your strategy and where you're planning on going in the next sort of 24 to 36 months. But be responsive to what's happening. I mean, we sort of set up to build this career tech platform and it took us a little bit longer than we hoped. But what we did alongside that was build up some training provision with UWTSD and that just exploded. So now we're in this position of hiring sort of freelance trainers to, to support the scaling of that training provision. So yeah, you, you have to, as Louise says, be responsive to what the business needs. Just a note on Kickstart, some practical advice because we've used Kickstart extensively. As Louise said, it wasn't set up particularly well. The infrastructure wasn't there in the beginning. We were one of the first to kind of apply and it took us six months to get the appointment approved. We were rejected twice. Um, that has now since improved. But what I would say is you need a really, really targeted recruitment strategy because you cannot rely on getting referrals from job coaches Right. Trying to find high quality candidates who are under 24 and on universal credit is not easy. And you've got to know what pools to fish in to find those candidates. And, you know, happy to talk to anybody about sort of, you know, methods and techniques for doing that. But it is really important. Otherwise, you'll spend six months with a role unfilled. Thanks, Jess. So, some really good advice there. And I'm sure you can add your details and people can contact you to pick up with yourself and Louise uh, a bit more on those, those points if needs be. Uh, Dale, how else are we doing on questions? Any others? We've got probably a bit, about five minutes left on the Q&A before we move into some networking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to follow up on your point, Jess, about it being a matter of linking strategy to what roles you want to fill. I appreciate today we've focused quite heavily on the benefits that remote working have brought to all of your businesses, but from a strategic point of view, what, what have you been your biggest challenges in terms of remote working? That's a really, really good question. Strategically, what have been our challenges? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, I can't. I mean, our strategy was to build a remote working organization. So I think we've had operational challenges in doing that. But I don't think our I don't think our overall strategy has really changed as a result. I mean, engagement has been more difficult than we expected. Workforce demographic has evolved in a way that we didn't expect. So we, you know, as I say, try to be incredibly inclusive with the language and the job adverts that we put out. But we have typically hired a workforce that's virtually all under 30 and we've got a couple of sort of more senior individuals who are over that age bracket and, and I'm sure you know this person will mind me saying but I get emails saying um Jess please can you explain to me how I changed this picture in PowerPoint right so they were some of the operational um considerations that maybe we didn't think about so I suppose how it will affect our strategy going forward is really focusing on how we engage over 25s um, and, and I suppose, you know, non-Gen Z workers in this remote culture because, you know, they've almost been born into it. It's their first job and it's quite normal and they just sort of get on with it. But I think for people who have worked in factories, people who have worked in, you know, traditional service type environments, it's quite hard making that transition. And I don't think that we fully anticipated that. So that's going to be the, the area in terms of bringing that, you know, strategy back in line, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I'd just add to that as well, Dale. Um, in, I think linking it back to the, the last question about around um, kind of like the, the recruitment as well is that, you know, in terms of one of the things in terms of strategy is that 
as Jessica mentioned previously, you can have a fantastic plan, but you've got to be able to um, amend that plan as things happen. You know, and what what the pandemic has shown us is basically anything can happen. <laughs> so you've got to be able to take that plan and you've got to be able to be flexible with it. And, and that strategy is going to change. So the values of your business, what you're trying to achieve, the problems that you're trying to solve, they they very much at the core stay the same, but the strategy might flex and it might change a bit. And linking it back to that previous question, it's been it's difficult when you're not together with your team to make quick decisions about hires that you might have made. So you might have invested very heavily in someone, you've trained them, you've brought them in, um, and then you find they're not the right person for your organization. And that happens. And I would say, you know, in all my experience of business, I all, I, in the past, I've tried to make that work. I've tried to work around that person and perhaps move them into other roles or, and, and that does affect strategy. And one of the difficult things I think about working remotely is not being able to, you, you, you really do need to be strong to make that quick decision and not be afraid to say, we've made a bit of a mistake here. This person isn't right. And we need to think about perhaps, you know, not extending their probation period or not bringing them on to a full-time role. Um, and, and that does affect strategy. Um, and, and it can be a bit more challenging when you're working remotely, I think. And on that, that point about making quick decisions, is that from a logistics point of view, because you're not in the same room having that conversation with people or is it a monitoring point of view? I think sometimes, you know, if you've got someone who, and I'm not talking from experience here, so this isn't something that's happened, but I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously working with a lot of businesses where, you know, there is quite a bit of movement at the moment. Um, and, you know, I think when you're seeing that person every day, you might be more willing to make a bit of a quicker decision and say, right, this, this isn't working. Let's, let's have a conversation about this. Whereas if you're not seeing them for a couple of weeks, they might not even be in your local area, you can't meet out, up with them. Then, you know, it just extends that challenge, I think a little bit more to be able to, but I'd say, don't be afraid of that. You know, in, in my experience, you know, you've got to do what's right for your teams and for the business. Okay. How else are we doing on questions, Dale? I'm very aware of time um, because I, I would like us to do some, um, networking in breakout rooms as well so we're approaching 22 with sort of 20 minutes or 15 minutes left so should we go with one more question then we'll look to breakout rooms then okay uh, we've, we've had a question on how you go about managing kpis and performance remotely um could you give us some indications of how you do that in your own businesses okay um I'll go with that. My, mine is quite simple. Um, so I have a, a team of recruiters and they are responsible for placing people in jobs. Um, if, if, if they aren't doing that, <laughs> they're not reaching a set level of KPI. Um, we're not a business that has rigid KPIs that, you know, individuals need to make 20 sales calls or send 20 candidates over. It's, a, it's about quality and it's about results. And that, that's how I'm measuring it. If they're, if they're not actually placing people in jobs, if, if, my, if my clients aren't happy, then I know that they're, they're not doing the right thing. Um, just, just going back on one of, the point, one of the points from earlier, there is a, a bit of a skills shortage out there at the moment, particularly across the Southwest. I know, I know it's national um, and that there's a lot of poaching of individuals within companies. And I think if you are losing individuals, it may be because they're not actually performing or they're not engaged. So as, as an employer, you just need to keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, my, my, my team, it's quite simple for me to measure. Thanks, Joe. Ooh. Jess? Yes, it's a, it's a really interesting question because in some ways the KPIs don't change all that much between a physical environment and a remote environment. You know, ultimately you're, you should be measuring, I suppose, their kind of contribution and performance and value creation. Um, I think sometimes in sort of physical working environments, we can get caught up in more 
you know, are they are they turning up on time and, you know, the, those sorts of things. So I, I suppose that the focus can shift a little bit, but in terms of work outputs, it's the same. What I would say is when you're moving from maybe kind of traditional management, project management, you know, waterfall style, that sort of stuff to agile, the metrics do change and they can be harder to measure. Um, so, for example, you know, if you were building a house and you know, this is a classic example, you, know, you might say, oh, I'll spend sort of two weeks doing the kitchen and I'll spend a week on the bathroom. And then what you find out is, you know, you've got asbestos in the ceiling or the walls are falling down and, you know, the project gets kicked out further and further and something like 60 or 70 percent of projects never actually deliver on time or don't deliver in full. Um, and so that kind of says that traditional management techniques and project management really doesn't work. Um, and Agile takes a very different approach to that. So we measure things like velocity and burn down. Um, and what we do, because of the actual measurement of that is really difficult, what we do is, is we've kind of made a policy where we've said, this is, a, you know, this is a major kind of culture change for a lot of people. If you've got you know, a Trello board, as, as we're using, you've got all these tasks on it. Once you've completed one of those tasks, we expect you to upload that. If you haven't completed that task by the end of the day, upload what you've got anyway. And that's a real difficult thing for people to get their heads around because a lot of people are perfectionists, right? And they don't want to upload something that's not finished or it's not substandard. But when we weren't doing that, people would spend weeks, <laughs> literally weeks, right? Eight days, I think, was, was one of the longest where they didn't actually complete or upload their work. So by getting into the habit of saying doesn't have to be perfect because we're all going to collaborate and we're all going to work on it together and we're all going to improve it by trying to bed that mindset in that you're not being measured on those you know results straight away I suppose people become more trusting and people become more transparent in how they work and you can identify issues faster um, and you can rectify things quicker and ultimately you know you get to a better quality output in the end even if you don't quite build a house on time what you end up with is is better overall so I think that's that's sort of what we're working through at the moment and I think again it's going to be different for different companies but I think it's less about rigid KPIs and more about progress and improvement and that collaboration piece again. Absolutely. Thank you Jess. Okay then I think uh, now might be an appropriate time to to sort of move towards the breakout rooms and allow our audience and participants to to do some networking and maybe share some of their own experience.